Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome to the Kansas Junior Livestock Show Lead Challenge. My name is Brittany Grother and I serve as the Lead Challenge Competition Coordinator. Thank you for joining us for our first Listen and Learn session. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. First of all, this Zoom session is a webinar. This means that you can hear and see our presenters, but they cannot hear or see you. Therefore, if you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the, end of, at the bottom of the screen. You can submit questions at any point during the session and our presenters will do their best to answer your questions at the end. Secondly, make sure you fill out the participation survey after each session to earn your participation points. The participation survey will ask your name, age division, and two questions about what you learned during each session. The survey links are located on the Kansas Junior Livestock Show website. Today's session is titled, Preparing for a Career in the Agriculture Industry. Our first speaker is Marie Ravellis, a Kansas State University senior majoring in agricultural education and global food systems leadership. Marie also serves as an intern at the Kansas Department of Agriculture and as part of her internship the past two years has helped write components of the LEAD Challenge. I will now turn it over to Marie. Everybody, I am going to share my screen real quick. So I will be talking about um, a little bit about the agriculture industry, why it's important, especially in Kansas, and then some career opportunities and why it's important to um, look at careers in agriculture and specifically Kansas. So the impact of the agricultural industry in Kansas is obviously really big. In the Midwest, um, agriculture is one of the largest sectors and that is true within Kansas. So when I say agriculture, I really mean agriculture, food, and food processing. Um, a lot of the times we kind of like to think of agriculture as the production side of things, but it is um, from the production to the consumer. So everything in between, and we do a lot of that in Kansas as well. When we're looking at the economic impact, it is $63.8 billion towards the Kansas economy. And that's 42%. So almost half of all revenue and economy in Kansas is because of agriculture, which is a really, really cool. Um, when we look at the job outlooks, it is 12.6% 12 12 of the workforce in Kansas. So 12.6% 12 12 is helping create half of the total economy. And of course there's the consumers and everything else uh, also uh, totally in the economy. A number, but when you think about it, uh, when we had that stay at home order, agriculture was considered essential. So it's really cool to understand this and learn this when you're looking for job outlooks in the future. And I know there is a wide range of participants um, in age here. So it's never too early or too late to start thinking about these things. But a job in agriculture, um, there's a huge outlook for it and it has a promising future. So when we're looking at the major ag sectors, um, here are the top 10. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, you can read them, but there are a couple I would like to point out. So number one is the beef cattle ranching, and that makes sense. We have lots of beef cattle. We have lots of feedlocks in Kansas and uh, lots of room for those kinds of animals. Another one I'd like to point out is the pet food manufacturing. When you think of Kansas, you don't necessarily think of the pet food industry, but we have a very large pet food. A lot of the byproducts from all of our animals go into the pet food manufacturing and uh, that makes sure that nothing is wasted and we are using all of it and we have a lot of pet manufacturing companies and places in Kansas. Another one is the farm machinery and equipment manufacturing. Um, when you think of the jobs you have to do in agriculture, you need the right tool and equipment for the job. So it makes sense that this is an up and coming uh, sector of agriculture. A lot of people are um, seeing now that the cool and new equipment coming out is really aiding them in their farm. Um, the last one I like to point out is the truck transportation. Sometimes this kind of gets forgotten, especially within the agriculture industry and from the outside looking in, you don't necessarily think of trucking as 
um, mainly agriculture. But like I said earlier, when you think of the production side to all the way to the consumer, trucking is a very important industry. And we learned that, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, how important it is. So this slide right here is a little overwhelming and I'm just gonna be quiet for a couple seconds. And I just want you to take in all of the jobs within agriculture. So if you know what you wanna do, and maybe it's not in agriculture, there is almost always a job that directly corresponds with a direct ag job. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And obviously this isn't all of the jobs in agriculture, but it is a huge majority of them. And I mean, there's things, crazy things from welding and farming to livestock graders. They're just, it's, it's a lot and it's overwhelming on purpose because there's so many options within agriculture. So this slide was a survey done, and this is the total current vacancies by pathway. And vacancies mean job opening, and pathway is the category or area of job. And what I'd like to point out is the agricultural mechanics and the agriculture business. So these are the small local businesses like co-ops and um, a lot of the other small uh, owners within agriculture that you see. We have a big need for those and then the agriculture mechanics and I'm going to talk a little bit about education requirements later, but as you can see, those will play into it. So just keep this in the back of your mind that um, these are the two largest sectors of uh, job openings within Kansas. So I said I was going to talk about education and something that uh, Russell Plaschke here at the Kansas Park Agriculture, Agriculture always likes to say is that whenever you're applying for a job, there's gonna be some on the site training no matter what. So you're never gonna walk into a job and know exactly what to do 100% of the time. There's gonna be some things that you're gonna have to learn. And um, that being said, 43% of jobs require a four year degree or a college. So education after high school. 26% of jobs require a high school diploma and 25% of jobs require a two year degree. So these are some very differing numbers, especially um, as we have moving um, later in the past years. Uh, not everybody needs a college education and we're seeing that a lot more, especially now as a college student. Almost 70% of people that enroll in college, 40% 40 40 of them do not graduate. And that is a really high number and it's very expensive to go to college, not finish it. So maybe have a plan in mind and I'll talk about that a little bit later too, but knowing what you wanna do, knowing the requirements and education for that so you can kind of head in that uh, degree and pathway before you just kind of waste some of your time and resources and money, um, you kind of have a set plan. And of course it's always okay to change your mind, but that way you kind of have a direction that you wanna go. So I'm going to spend some time talking about this slide. So when you're looking to prepare for a job, especially in the agriculture industry, but even in just in general, um, the best way to start is with what you like to do. Do you like to work with people? Do you like to work with animals? Do you like numbers? Do you like writing? Do you like taking pictures? Starting with what you like to do will really help you narrow it down so you're not doing a job that you don't enjoy doing. Another one is asking questions. Ask questions to your parents, ask questions to professionals, to your teachers so you can learn more, so you can kind of help narrow um, down the pathway. Does this job require a lot of talking or does this job require a lot of math and writing? Um, those are very important things to understand when you are looking for stuff. Another one is research. And if you still don't know, maybe you really like working with animals and with people, um, a really good resource is agcareers.com and agexplorer.com. This is a career pathway plan. You can, they ask you a bunch of questions and at the end of it, it'll kind of give you a couple of careers that um, really suits you. So it, it, it may help you narrow down some more. Um, it's kind of cool just to explore what's in there too. And it also um, says what education requirements are needed. And um, I mean, it just has a variety of things, job descriptions, lots of jobs that you would never even think of. It's really cool to just kind of look around and see what's out there. And one of the last things to ask is what am I good at? So this kind of goes along with what do you like, but what are your strengths? Are you really good with numbers? Are you really good with organizing? Are you really good at proofreading or taking pictures? And um, 
if you enjoy what you're going to be doing and if you are good at it, uh, there's a good chance you'll find uh, your success and happiness within your career, which is ultimately the end goal. So once you have determined that, how do you get to where you want to go? So the biggest thing is networking. You all are going to be at KJLS. That is a great place to network. Find those industry professionals, ask them questions, ask if you can job shadow, if you can go spend a day looking at their job, what they do. People love that because it shows that you have an interest and they're going to want you to come and join the industry, especially if you're passionate about it. Internships are another great way. Um, it gives you a little bit more responsibility, a little bit more hands-on, so you can actually see what the job is like. Some good resources also are your 4-H extension agent and your agriculture education instructor. Uh, they have a huge network. They know a ton of people. They also know a lot about the career industry and um, a lot of things that can help you succeed and get to where you want to be. So definitely use your resources. An agriculture network is everything. Um, if they don't know, so they don't know the answer, they can normally find somebody who has the answer and can connect you. Um, also, the industry is really good, especially with experiences. There is no such thing as a bad experience. If you don't like a job, that shows you that you don't want to go that path. So be very open to just trying new things. Because like I said, if you don't like it, you know you don't want to do that. And if you do like a certain pathway or job experience, then you know that um, that's something that you might want to look forward to and in, into in the future. Something that we did with the Kansas Department of Agriculture is immersion experiences. We're looking to do more of these, especially with different um, pathways and different uh, companies, but we did this with the dealership, and it was just really a hands-on day for some high school seniors. And if you're in high school, this would be something really cool to participate in, and if you're not, this would be something that you look forward to when you get into high school. But basically, we partnered with a dealership, and students got a very hands-on experience of what a day at a dealership would look like. They got to drive brand new tractors and equipment. They got to deal with um, finding parts and fixing things and taking calls and the customer service and um, the management in, um, industry and a lot of different things that you wouldn't consider the typical ag job. So it was a really good experience for them. Um, they basically got a job shadow for a day, but it was very much hands-on. They got to do it with guidance and um, the company was super, super happy to have so many students interested and um, be there for that day. So that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box below and also contact um, the Kansas Department of Agriculture. We would love to connect you with any other resources and especially Russell Flashka. He's the workforce development um, guy here, so he would love to help answer any of your questions. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Brittany. All right, thank you, Marie. So our next speaker is Stephanie Trump, and she is the Director of People and Culture at Prairie Land Partners, LLC. Prairie Land is a company that specializes in selling new and pre-owned John Deere branded equipment and, as, and equipment such as lawn, lawn care equipment and tractors. Thank you for taking time to speak with us tonight. Thank you. Marie, you did such a great job. I feel like, gosh, I don't even have anything to talk about. I can just um, go ahead and, and go home. But um, no, but it was really great, Marie, to, to listen to your presentation and reflect about all of the different um, careers that are available in agriculture. And I'm going to talk to you specifically from my point of view um, and what we look for when we're hiring um, people to come work for us. So a little bit of background about myself as well. I, um, we're located, our headquarters are in Hutchinson, Kansas, but Prairie Land has John Deere dealerships all over the state of Kansas. We have 15 different locations. Um, before I became the director of people and culture, and really what that means is anything that an employee needs to do his or her job better at my company, whether it's how they get paid on time or the benefits they get, health insurance, dental insurance, or if they need to know what they're supposed to wear, um, if they need to know how to do their job, we organize the training. So the, a role in human resources is another name for it, is really a role in taking care of the people that work for your business. So that is what I, that's what I do. I grew up on a farm 
um, outside of Hutchinson, Kansas. I was involved in 4-H as a child and showed cattle. And um, so I'm really excited to have this opportunity to speak to, to all of you. And I know that we have a wide range of ages of students, but I think um, I echo what Marie said, it's never too early to start learning about or thinking about a career in agriculture and it's never too late to start thinking about a career in agriculture. And I think I'm a perfect example of that. So I have what some people might not even think as a career in agriculture because I'm doing human resources, but because I'm in the agricultural industry and, and all of our customers are farmers and ranchers and producers, I um, am definitely, I definitely have a career in agriculture and it's not something that I initially anticipated. When I grew up on a farm, I thought I wanted to, but then I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. So I went to K-State and then I went to law school and I practiced law for several years. Um, we lived in a big city, we lived in Denver, and my husband and I were both from Kansas and we really decided we wanted to come home. We wanted to come back um, to Reno County, the community where I was raised because we wanted our children to have similar experiences that, that I had as a kid. And even though we weren't going to raise them on the farm, like I was raised on the farm, they would be close to their grandparents and they would have other opportunities that living in Kansas gives you that living in a big city doesn't give you. So I was one of those that didn't think I would have a career in agriculture, but now that I have one, I can't believe it took me so long. So I wanna to talk to you tonight just about a couple of things that when you're starting to look for a job, whether that's a high school job or maybe even you're in middle school and you wanna start babysitting or you're talking about a job that you're gonna get after high school or that you're a job that you want for your career if you decide to go on to have further education, what are those things that you need? And whether it is your very first job or, or your you know, three or four jobs into your career, everybody needs basic skills. And so I wanna to talk to you about two different categories of skills. Um, one is those people skills, what everybody needs just to be a good employee and those kinds of skills that we really encourage people to start practicing and start developing as early as you can. And then of course, technical skills. So technical skills really refer to someone's ability to do the job. Marie talked about the education someone needs and she referenced that Russell says that the education you bring into the job is only a small part of what you do and you learn have hands-on and you learn what you're doing as you go about your day-to-day -day job. And that's really true. But when we are looking and trying to decide whether we wanna hire someone for a job at Prairie Land Partners, and we hire large ag salespeople, um, parts people, so people that provide parts both to our service shop and to customers who wanna repair their own equipment, and agricultural mechanics, we call them technicians. So technicians who repair and service all of the combines and tractors and forage harvesters and cotton strippers that we sell to our customers. So if someone wants to come work for Prairie Land Partners, number one, we wanna know, do they have the right kind of education? And depending on what that job is, um, we require different types of education. So we look at, did they go to school to do what they wanted to do? For our ag tech, um, our mechanics, we, we want them to have a two year degree in ag diesel mechanics. Um, but if they don't have a two year degree and they're willing to do something called an apprenticeship, then we want to know um, whether they'd be a good candidate for an apprenticeship. And number two, so we look at their education, we look at their experience. So do they have any experience doing the job that we want them to do? But experience isn't just, I've spent time selling equipment before, so now I know I'd be good at selling equipment. Anything that you do is giving you experience and how you choose to apply that experience to any job you wanna have, that really makes the difference and that's what we're looking at. So let me give you a couple of examples of how some experiences you may be getting right now will help you when you um, decide to look for a job and when you're going into your career. So I would imagine that there are those out there that are involved in sports in school or you play, a, you play on a summer baseball or softball team. Maybe there are some of you that are playing t-ball right now or volleyball or basketball. I have children and they're running cross country right now and they're on the swim team. Um, anything that you do that's participating in sports or anything that requires a team is teaching you teamwork. And teamwork really at its very um, core teaches you how to get along with people. 
And if you're going to go work for anybody that has more than one employee, you have to know how to get along with people. So the skills that you're learning right now, being a part of a team, are going to help you in any job that you have later on. Um, I know that many of you are probably involved in 4-H or FFA. Um, those kinds of skills I remember as a child preparing my sewing projects and my cooking projects along with my livestock projects, getting ready for the 4-H fair. And what do you have to do when you're baking that grand champion cake is you have to learn to be able to follow instructions. You have to have an attention to detail to make sure that you've done everything perfectly. Um, if you're getting your outfit ready that you've just sewn, you've got to sew your seams straight, you've got to press your hem just right. So those types of skills that you're learning when you're preparing your projects, when even when you're preparing your animals to go into the show, they have to look their very best. That shows that you care, that you have an attention to detail. So the things that you're doing now and the things that you're involved in or maybe have been involved in since you were a kid, are going to help you in your career in the future. And I know that they've certainly helped me. And finally, the things that you're doing as part of um, the Livestock Association, caring for your animals. I remember vividly my mom waking me up early because I had to do chores. And I remember thinking, why do I have to do this? My other friends at school get to sleep in every day. You know, all summer long, you're getting up and you're taking care of your animals, you're teaching them how. Um, to lead, you're giving them baths, all of those things. And you think, my friends aren't having to do this. Man, they're on vacation at the lake. Why can't I be doing this? But what all of that taught me was responsibility. And it taught me from a young age that I could be responsible for something, that I could see something through to the end, and I had something to be proud of. Employers want to hire individuals, both men and women, who are responsible, that have a hard work ethic, that have that grit, and when they see those experiences that you talk about in a cover letter, I see that you're going to be writing a cover letter and a resume. If you can outline those experiences and show how your experience on a sports team or how your experience preparing projects for 4-H or how your experience having livestock actually gave you the responsibility and the experiences that you know will help make you good in a job. So that's all about technical skills and your ability then to tell me how your experiences that you've had, whatever they are, transfer into what the job is that you need to do. The other thing that's really, really important, and this is what I'll, I'll finish with today, are our people skills. So remember I said I'm looking for two different things. I'm looking for your technical skills, um, your education and your experience and your abilities but I'm also looking at your people skills. And people skills are also something that you can start developing right now. So some things that you need to think about. Um, when we're out of COVID area and era and we can shake hands again, it means something to look someone in the eye and shake their hand and tell them that you're glad to meet them. I know that I can tell the difference during an interview. Um, Today was actually the K-State All-Career Fair, and typically we're in person at K-State meeting college students and interviewing them for summer internships. And we didn't get that opportunity this year. We had to do it just like this, virtually. And we don't get the same experience because I don't get to feel the firmness of a candidate's handshake. So that still means something to me. A clear and confident voice. When you interview for your first job, similar to the first time you had to stand up and give a speech in front of your classmates or maybe as part of a club experience, you're nervous and it's hard to be confident. So you need to practice. But the more confident you can sound when you're talking to someone about a job, um, the better off you'll be perceived. Eye contact, there is nothing that drives me crazy is when I wanna meet someone and they're looking down or they're looking this way or they're looking this way because they're, again, it's probably because they're nervous, but you've got to really work on those people skills of looking someone right in the eye, shaking their hand and speaking confidently. Um, neatness counts. I'm probably starting to sound like your mother and I am a mom, I have five children of my own. So these are things that we talk about every day, but neatness counts. So when you're going to meet someone, you make sure that your shirt is clean, that your jeans don't have any spots on it, that you're tucked in, that your hair is done correctly. Because what that shows an employer is that you are trustworthy, that you take this seriously, and that you'll be a professional. Um, say thank you. So if someone gives you the opportunity to do a job shadow or gives you an internship 
or even just take some time to sit down with you and talk to you about what they do in their career, make sure that you tell them thank you. Send them a thank you note. Um, that might mean a formal written thank you note, but in this day and age, I get a lot of thank you notes by email. And I think that those are really helpful and those mean just as much to me as a handwritten thank you note. But it's when someone recognizes that someone takes time out of their day to spend time with you to tell them thank you. Um, it's really important. Okay, so I wanna talk to you, to those of you out there who have access to the internet and may have a phone at home, maybe mom and dad gives you access to a phone or you have a social media account that you're able to use. And, and this could be a wide range because I know there are different rules in different families. But what I want to tell you is when, I, when someone applies for a job at Prairie Land, the very first thing I do, and I'm gonna sound a little old school because we go to Facebook first, but I do look at their Facebook account and I look at their Instagram account and I Google their name to see if there are any Thing about them that I can learn. Number one, because I want to just get to know them a little bit before I have a chance to interview them. And number two, I want to make sure that they represent themselves professionally and appropriately on um, social media. So the things that you're doing now and that you put out there, I know you've probably heard from your parents that once you put something out on the internet, it can never go away, even when you delete it. So even now, I'm encouraging you to be really careful with your social media accounts um, because your employer or your future employer can access those accounts and they'll, they might use that to want to get to know you. So make sure that you're using social media in a responsible and appropriate way and in a way when you think that maybe someday my future employer might um, look at the things that I'm doing on social media and you want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward in that way. So those are the pieces of advice. Technical experience is, is very important, but those people skills are also very important. I would encourage you, um, if you're at all interested in a career with an a ag equipment dealership, um, John Deere, I can only speak for John Deere dealers, and I can specifically speak for Prairie Land Partners. The need that we have for ag diesel mechanics, um, we call them technicians, is only going to grow. Um, we would hire 30 technicians today if I could find qualified technicians to fill our spots. And these jobs are jobs that um, people start out making 50, 60, $70,000 a year after just two years of education. And we have many technicians that are making 80, 90, and even over $100,000 to do these jobs. Even better is if you are interested, if you're a high school junior or senior and you're interested in pursuing a career in ag diesel mechanics, many dealerships, not just Prairie Land. So if we're not close to where you are, there are lots of dealerships that have scholarship programs that will gladly, um, if they'll interview you, and then we'll go through all the things that we talked about today, they'll interview you and they'll wanna know if you're a good fit. And if you are, many of these dealerships are providing tools and tuition to students. So you could finish two years, be debt free, and start a career making um, a very solid living wage here in Kansas and have a career in agriculture. So that's my little plug. I, I wouldn't do my job if I didn't um, have a chance to tell you about that as well. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. I will now turn the session over to my team member, Russell Plashka, who has been monitoring your questions during the session. You still have plenty of time to put in your questions, so please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box down below. Thank you, Brittany. And we do have a question on the Q&A, and so I'll open this up first to Stephanie. So the question is, this person is from a remote area of Kansas, so very rural, and they're wondering, are there still opportunities for an agribusiness career and if so, do you have some specific suggestions for them? Well, I think that um, no matter where you're from, there's always an opportunity for careers in agribusiness. I think sometimes you have to examine your willingness to relocate maybe a little bit or how far are you away. But we have um, dealerships in, in quite in small communities all over the state. And I think that um, 
once you decide the area that you want to be in, just, you know, Google is everybody's friend too, the research that you can do. I grew up in a town of 500 people. Um, so it was rural. And we were fortunate that we were 30 miles from Hutchinson, but um, I, I didn't have, you know, I went to a very small high school, but I knew what I wanted to do and I stuck to that path and I learned how to use the experiences that I had to show how I could be successful at things. And I think that that's what opened opportunities for me. Marie, would you have a response for that person's question? I would just echo what she had to say, but um, earlier I mentioned networking. Um, the more people you know, the more people that can help you get where you want to, um, to succeed. Uh, our culture really lives, especially in the rural communities and areas. And um, we're actually working on a project with the Kansas Department of Agriculture that we're trying to build up those rural communities. And so maybe it's not getting a job somewhere, maybe it's starting a job, maybe it's thinking outside of the box. So don't ever give up on um, agriculture, uh, especially in the rural communities. That's where it started. And um, there's still a lot of people who are invested in that and uh, you could really make a difference, especially in a small rural town. Thank you both. Another question, and I am sure Stephanie will love this question. How important is it to learn to write well, even if communication is not a field I want to explore, or <laughs> I see you clapping your hands, or if communication really isn't, you know, thought of as being necessary for that job. Oh my gosh, that feels like that question was just made for me. It is extremely important to learn to write well. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to become a Pulitzer Prize winning author, but I talked um, about our, our careers in ag diesel mechanics. If our mechanics cannot tell the story of the work that they did on a customer's combine and write clearly, and spell correctly, then we can't then turn around and bill the customer for the work that we did. If we can't bill the customer for the work that we did on that customer's combine, then we can't make any money. And if we can't make any money, then we can't stay in business. So even those degrees or those jobs that you think don't require um, written communication because you're not gonna be a professional writer or an English teacher, every job, I, I would, Pro I I'm, I'm probably can't say every job ever created requires communication skills, but almost every job ever created requires communication skills. Um, and just as important are verbal communication skills. We say in our dealership that everyone who works for Prairie Land Partners sells everything to everybody every day. So even me in human resources, I'm a salesperson because every time I interact with anybody, it matters how I talk about the company that I work for. So if I can't talk about the company that I work for in a positive way and in a professional way, then I'm not doing my job. Perfect. Thank you, Stephanie. Our next question I'm going to throw to Marie first. Do you know of any other career opportunities out there besides a diesel technician? that they might explore and they want to stay living in a rural area. So I would start first by um, where you are at geographically. I think that has a lot to do with um, certain uh, careers and industry, but um, maybe it's you live in the dairy land of Kansas. So maybe it's working in a dairy, maybe it's um, working as a farmhand and then meeting more people in, um, finding what you're passionate about. And I think that's what I'm going to go back to is just what are you passionate about doing? If you don't want to be a diesel technician, you're not going to be happy doing that. What would you be happy doing? And look for that job and look for that career, look for the people with connections doing it. And um, you'll be able to find a job doing what you're passionate about, even if it's in a rural community. Thank you, Marie. And Stephanie, we had a follow up. So on the communication, on the necessity of a strong written communication. So this person, if they intend to pursue a two-year technical degree, how might they learn to enhance their written and oral communication skill at a technical degree? That's great. So when um, our ag tech students attend um, the college of their choice, 
So we have local community colleges and then we have partnerships with specific schools in Fort Scott, Kansas, Garden City, Kansas, and Milford, Nebraska are the three closest ones. And our students get associate's degrees. They have to take um, comp one and they have opportunities to take other classes um, while they're getting their degree that would help them with their written and their verbal communication skills. And also, in any time you get a chance to speak to a group and tell them about something, you're working on your verbal communication skills. Any time that you have a chance to write a paper about something or write a letter or even send an email, take a look back over the email that you send and say, gosh, does this sound like it's professional? We get, I can't spell anymore because of spell check, but it's try to use full words. You know, in this age of texting and short little, you know, you are instead of Y-O-U-A-R-E, try to remember to, to be able to use those sorts of things and then look for other opportunities. You never stop learning. So even if you're out of school and you're in your career, there are other opportunities in the community to continue working on your verbal and your written communication skills. And if that's something that when you're out of school, you still want to get better at, ask someone for, you know, you'll get a mentor, ask a mentor to help you and, and just write something or people will always be there helping you get better. When I became a lawyer, man, that's all lawyers do is they write and they talk. And I thought I was pretty good at it. And I quickly learned I wasn't. And so I used every opportunity as a learning opportunity to get better. So Russell, just like what you said, you've only learned a part of what you need to know before you go to work. Same with your writing skills and your verbal communication skills. But it is really important to focus on them um, throughout your education. Thank you, Stephanie. And now we'll throw it back to Marie for this question. Uh, this person is wanting to know a little more about how can they find help in guiding them to find that best career path for them. So I mentioned a resource earlier and it's agcareers.com. There's also another one, agexplore.com. Um, they're both really fantastic websites. I would start with the ag careers one. It is so in depth. It's fun to just play around and I would encourage everybody um, to just kind of play around with that website. It, it's like a test and you find your strengths, what you really like to do and it kind of narrows you down and I was, I'm just still so impressed with all like the specifics of the careers that they have there. I mean, there's like plant special, I mean, there's obviously like plant specialists, but there's in every variety, there's animals and there's uh, electricians and there's, I mean, everything within the agriculture industry. And so, like I said earlier, if you find a career that's not in agriculture, you can almost always find the coordinating career that is in agriculture. That is the same thing. And it's really cool just to explore. And the other one is agexplore.com. That one's through National FFA. And that does a very good job too. So it'll just help you kind of narrow your search down and you want to find more information about. Stephanie, did you have anything you wanted to add on how they can maybe find help? Okay, great. And then we have one other question. I'll throw that back to Brittany. Uh, they were asking about the speaker's emails, if that'll be posted online for them to send some thank yous. Sure, I think that sounds like a great idea, especially after what we just listened to tonight on thanking everyone. So I will, um, at the end of the challenge, post a Word document that has everyone's email address from all the sessions and maybe some of our sponsors as well so that you guys can send thank you notes. And I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. All right. So thank you to everyone who participated live this evening and for those who are watching the recorded version at a later date. Um, just a couple of reminders. Intermediates and seniors, please remember to sign up for your prepared speech time for either Thursday or Friday of this week online. Also, everyone who participated and watched the video either live or recorded, don't forget to fill out your participation survey, which is located at the Kansas Junior Livestock Show website. Join us tomorrow night for the second session titled, The Effect of COVID-19 on the Food Supply Chain. Thank you and have a good rest of your evening.